is a fit for, fit for 55, which is the goal of reducing emissions by 55% by 2030, and the goal of reaching net zero by 2050. But Europe is also under considerable pressure in responding to geopolitical events, most significantly the Russian war of aggression on Ukraine, including its impacts on European supply chains, impacting energy and raw materials supply. These disruptions to supply chains have highlighted Europe's vulnerability in regard to the resources in the earth beneath our feet. Fossil fuels, yes, but also critical minerals to support our transition to a green energy future. For example, through the raw materials required for the millions of new electric vehicles, for the electricity infrastructure required to support them, for the infrastructure for renewable technologies and production and distribution of green energies from renewable sources, and much more. But the increasing focus on and recognition that the Earth's subsurface is crucial to a sustainable future is not restricted to minerals and energy. It also applies, for example, to groundwater, the largest freshwater resource on the planet, which is under increasing pressure through the impact of fertilizers and pesticides in agriculture, industrial and household contaminants, and overuse creating water shortages, land subsidence, and reduced flow in rivers. In addition, climate change is impacting on coastal erosion, on the nature and frequency of geological hazards, such as landslides, resulting from unusual heavy rain events, and it will continue to impact our cities, which must quickly adapt and dramatically adapt to the requirement to change energy sources and conflicting land and subsurface use. Eurogea surveys is fortunately in exactly the right position to support the dynamic policy environment resulting from these multiple and sometimes conflicting subsurface uses, water, energy, minerals, for example. This is because Eurogea surveys is a mature, more than 50 years old organisation representing 37 geological surveys of Europe, surveys that host a huge archive of data and knowledge of the European subsurface. Eurogeo surveys provides public earth science knowledge to support the EU's competitiveness, social well-being, environmental management and international commitments. It coordinates the network of the geological surveys of Europe, jointly addressing European issues in the field of geoscience and collaborating on projects that directly inform EU, local and national policy for the benefit of all European citizens. As is the case for ASME, at the heart of Eurogeo surveys are our expert groups. Hundreds of experts from the geological surveys of Europe are engaged in our 10 expert groups and one task force, carrying out research that directly tackles diverse societal challenges and helps to build a sustainable future. These expert groups include earth observation and geohazards, geoenergy, geoheritage, geochemistry, geological mapping and modelling, marine geology, mineral resources, spatial information, urban geology, water resources and international cooperation and development. International collaboration is central to much of the work of Eurogea surveys, to build strategic partnerships, to build our scientific networks, and indeed to improve our science through collaboration and knowledge sharing. That includes projects in Africa in partnership with the Organization of African Geological Surveys. It includes our active membership of the World Community of Geological Surveys, where Eurogea surveys will host the activities committee for 2023 and 2024. It includes our status as cooperating country of the Coordinating Committee for Geoscience Programs in East and Southeast Asia, CCOP. And of course, it includes our close relationship with ASME, most recently through active engagement between our expert groups, and notably last month through joint engagement on the Policy Dialogues event in Chile, in which ASME and EGS together with the European Commission, discussed the development of a critical raw materials map of Ibero-America. 
UHEA's contribution to this dialogue draws on years of collaborative work on EU-funded raw materials projects, including ProMine, Minerals for EU, EU RAR, EGDI and GeoERA, notably the GeoERA Frame project, which all now feed into and are delivered through the European Geological Data Infrastructure, EGDI, which is freely accessible online. My hope is that this will be a dialogue that leads to more engagement and to mutually beneficial joint future work between ASME and Eurogea surveys. Central to all of Eurogea surveys activities within Europe and abroad is the commitment to delivering expert knowledge to policymakers, to industry and to the public. Policy in particular will need to be flexible and responsive in the coming years in order to adjust to rapidly changing situations and technologies. To achieve the goal of up-to-date expert knowledge feeding into policy, the science policy interface must also be resilient and based on sound, harmonised scientific data and effective delivery of that data and knowledge in the appropriate format and in the appropriate timescale for policymakers. Bridging the science policy interface is where the concept of a geological service for Europe comes in, a service provided through the collaborative efforts of the geological surveys of Europe, providing the diverse data and expertise on the European subsurface that is embodied in the geological surveys of Europe and the Eurogeo surveys expert groups. This concept already practically exists as a five-year project coordinated by Eurogea surveys with 48 partner organisations, mainly but not solely represented by the Geological Surveys of Europe. Central to the Geological Service for Europe concept, concept is the continuing development of the European Geological Data Infrastructure, which remains central to Eurogea surveys and to the Geological Service for Europe project and is the outlet for all of the data gathered not just through this project but more generally harvested from the Geological Surveys of Europe as they gather and harmonise new data and knowledge that can inform our use and our protection of the European subsurface. But it's important to note that the Geological Service for Europe project is just that, a five-year project. In contrast, the needs of the European Union are ongoing in regard to understanding the overlapping uses of the subsurface and our need not only to use but to protect subsurface resources. It will be necessary for Eurogeo surveys, as it will be for surveys and survey organisations around the world, to continue to provide science-based knowledge and expertise to inform policies on an ongoing basis into the future. For that reason, Eurogea Surveys is aiming to establish a framework in which such a geological service for Europe can be sustainably funded and continue to directly serve these policy needs into the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Bien, aún en su ausencia, eh... <coughs> Agradecemos el esfuerzo de haber hecho una grabación eh, para ASMI y me permito recordar a los presentes que con, con EGS, con Eurosurveys, ASMI eh, firmó un memorado de entendimiento eh, con motivo de una asamblea general de las dos asociaciones, de Eurosurveys y de ASMI, que se celebraron en Madrid en, en octubre de, mil, de 2015, con una estructura en la que eh, lunes y martes eh, había sesiones en paralelo, por una parte de Rio Service, por otra parte EGS. El miércoles tuvimos una sesión conjunta de las dos asociaciones, se procedió a esa firma del memorando de entendimiento. El jueves eh, vuelta a separarnos en sesiones paralelas para, en el caso nuestro, discutir las ventajas, la, las facilidades que nos aportaba ese mal entendimiento para fortalecer relaciones con otras organizaciones y en fin, aprovechar la oportunidad que nos daba ese memorando para poder participar conjuntamente en proyectos financiados por la Unión Europea, que finalmente fueron positivas.
Y el viernes tuvimos una sesión de campo, una visita de campo, a una ciudad próxima a Madrid, a Segovia, eh, que todos celebramos. Eh, de modo que, que creo que las relaciones desde entonces para acá han sido de, de confianza mutua. Eh, tenemos la, eh, una actividad, en cierto modo, para él. En NASMI tenemos grupos de trabajo de expertos, también lo tienen en EGS, y, y hay un vínculo entre los dos eh, grupos de grupos de trabajo, que es el que denominamos, denominan y denominamos Grupo de Cooperación Internacional, que en los dos casos, el Grupo de Cooperación Internacional de EGS y el de ACMI, está coordinado justamente por Diana Ponce de León, eh, aquí presente. Y, y, y bueno, y como remate de este eh, reconocimiento de la participación y buenas relaciones con EGS, eh, en la primera semana de noviembre, los días eh, 2, 3 y 4, en Santiago de Chile, ha tenido lugar un evento doble, por una parte una convención minera vinculada a un proyecto financiado por la Unión Europea de la, una plataforma para el desarrollo de los recursos minerales eh, vinculada a una historia de ya 10-12 años de lo que se denominó y se denomina diálogos políticos eh, Europa-América Latina en materias primas y que este año eh, ha tenido una, un añadido eh, eh, para la participación de y intercambio de experiencias entre los servicios geológicos de ASMI, Iberoamérica, y de Europa, Eurosolves, eh, en relación con el, el tema de la reunión, eran minerales críticos y estratégicos en general. Eh, la reunión, eh, yo no podré asistir, pero en representación de ASMI estuvo eh, Eduardo Zapetini, de la Junta Directiva de ASMI, en representación de EGS, como institución, como organización, estuvo el actual presidente, que es además el, servido, el director del Servicio de, de, de Alemania, y estuvieron los responsables, coordinadores de los grupos de trabajo de recursos minerales de Europa, de metalogenia, en, en NASBI, eh, para justamente hablar de los, aprender de la experiencia europea de minerales críticos, exponer las líneas de acción de ASMI en minerales críticos, en concreto con la elaboración del mapa de, de América Latina de minerales críticos, y también un aporte de ASMI que no tiene la experiencia en la parte europea, que es la de los pasivos ambientales mineros, tanto en su caracterización, inventariado y evaluación de la peligrosidad o amenaza ambiental, como en la de recuperación de los relaves, de los, de los eh, residuos, de los eh, pasivos, como minería secundaria en el aprovechamiento de sustancias que en su momento, por cuestiones tecnológicas, no eran aprovechables o porque se, desconía, se desconocía su utilidad, caso de tea raras o minerales críticos. O que ha sido un éxito, ha reunido, como digo, a los, a los líderes, digamos, de, representando a la, a la asociación, eh, a las dos asociaciones y a los eh, expertos de ambas, de ambas eh, asociaciones. Eh, y es una, digamos, la, el último evento en el que ha habido fruto de aquel nuevo entendimiento esa colaboración. Así que, de nuevo, agradecer la participación, aunque sea en remoto o en diferido, de, de Yuli por la presentación que nos ha hecho. Y pasamos entonces a proyectar la siguiente eh, presentación, que es la del director del Servicio de Canadá, el doctor Daniel Lebel, eh, con quien venimos colaborando ya desde hace tiempo. Eh, él, personalmente, y el Servicio Lógico que representa, junto con el Servicio Lógico de Estados Unidos, y Orollos Orbes son las tres patas de un trípode que está promocionando y ya ha iniciado una, lo que llaman una comunidad mundial de servicios geológicos, en la que ASMI participa junto con la Asociación de Servicios Geológicos Africanos y con la de la Organización de con los Servicios Geológicos de Oriente, de Asia. Y eh, como instituciones no adscritas a ninguna asociación, pues están naturalmente los que ya he mencionado, promotores, el Servicio de Canadá y de Estados Unidos, y también de Australia y Nueva Zelanda. Eh, con ese motivo eh, y con relación a anteriores, eh, mantenemos una relación de amistad y colaboración con el Servicio de Canadá y al pedirle la participación en este evento, por razones de horario, eh, Level nos ha enviado una, una grabación, un saludo, que pasamos a proyectar en este momento. Adelante, por favor. Hello, I am Daniel Lebel. Hola desde Ottawa, Canada. Mi nombre es Daniel Lebel. 
y soy el director general del Servicio Eológico de Canadá. I would like to acknowledge the lands of the indigenous in which I'm, on which I'm making this presentation, the Anishinaabe people of the Ottawa region. This uh, session uh, that uh, you've invited me, I'm very honored to attend. Uh, I imagine the beautiful landscape in Barcelona, and I wish I could be there, but it wasn't to be. A big thank you to the Association of the Ibero American Geological Survey and Mining Surveys, ASGMI, for the invitation to speak to this workshop. So to start, I will briefly talk about the Geological Survey of Canada and our mission. At the national level, we pursue innovation for evidence-based decision-making to support our mission. This mission provides geoscience information to underpin the responsible development of Canada's geological resource and serves the public under the mandate of our minister, the Minister of Natural Resources of Canada. We support the competitive regime of mineral and energy sector, uh, demonstrating environmental stewardship and ensuring the safety and security of Canada, all issues on which we have some uh, very important program. And we're supplying public geoscience. All of our information is free. It's deemed a public good and supplied to anyone that wishes to access it through our website and various publication any type of geology, geochemical, geophysical, or other types of data and knowledge that uh, we have. I will speak more fully now about uh, uh, the, uh, the topic here on land use, but first let me uh, tell you about our annual report. If you wish to learn more about the activities of the Geological Survey of Canada, we produce an annual report. This one is for 2020-21. A new one is coming up shortly. We uh, tell the story in detail of all of our activities, so you'll find more there. Our public geoscience informed decision making on land use and a variety of other purposes. Our knowledge is uh, made available and translated in simple terms up to some specific products. And we seek to really engage with policymakers and the public in general on matters that uh, are of importance. And for this, we need to touch the art of the public. Uh, in terms of speaking uh, to them about our science, not expressing opinion, but presenting the facts as they are. Public geoscience is required to maximize benefit for Canada's uh, uh, rich land endowment that's uh, as a rich supply of minerals and energy, but also as a number of issues, uh, such as the impact of climate change in the other natural hazards, such as earthquakes and volcanoes. Yes, we do have a few volcanoes in Canada. For the purpose of this uh, talk uh, in Canada, land use management requires geoscience for a number of, of issues, such as asserting our offshore sovereignty, uh, making onshore and offshore territory attractive for investment in energy and minerals in particular, reducing risk from climate change and other geohazards, as well as protecting biodiversity by setting some land aside to make, uh, uh, to make natural reserve, national park. We also have a number of activities that relate to the environmental impact for a major project and all geoscience can help address uh, impact of major projects as, such as mining project on groundwater. The uh, activities of the Geological Survey of Canada uh, frame uh, at, uh, at the present time through uh, four strategic lines uh, or geoscience and uh, consistent principally mapping activities and broad scale uh, on the onshore and offshore uh, are, are embedded in the first pillar on the left, geoscience knowledge for onshore and offshore has a lot of aspect that relates to land management support Geoscience for sustainable development include mineral and energy resource, and our geoscience to keep Canada safe touches on geohazard and climate change. All this we uh, target uh, objectives that uh, ties with national policy, and in turn, national policy is often very much tied to commitment that Canada has made relative to uh, the Convention of the United Nations on Climate Change, 
or the Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction or Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. So uh, we are all united in common cause as geological survey in these endeavors. Often I see other colleagues that have very much similar activities in their nation and also relative to international treaties. Since our beginning, our approach to the public geoscience has evolved. We've developed a vision through generation of geoscience. Uh, we're into the eighth generation of the GSC which has uh, gone in various broad steps from early work on nation, nation building, maps and geoscience surveys, observation on the ground with the basic stone and compass and making maps to one which has drawn increasingly from geophysical data and other types of data to develop models to the development of IT system around the 1990s, as we all know, informatics has been a tremendous support to start developing a predictive system and the field of predictive geoscience that is with us today. Uh, all of this predictive geoscience is very helpful to policy and our geoscience is in great demand right now in Canada to achieve economic, social and environmental benefits for Canada and the world. Public geoscience is solicited on many fronts. We have an extensive landmass, second largest landmass in the world uh, in terms of territory, uh, an extensive offshore as well. We have a very diverse land regime with many stakeholders and a jurisdiction at lower level that have uh, vast uh, uh, claims or, or jurisdiction over territory. Much of Canada's management of lands lies with the province and territories, and we have to uh, support Indigenous uh, people that have also land climbs in rates that are historical and back uh, to thousands of years. Uh, Canada aspires to be a global uh, leader of uh, production of critical minerals that are required for the world transition to a clean economy and a brand new strategy has just uh, been released uh, first as a discussion paper uh, so that Canada can uh, really help the world move into uh, the development of clean energy and renewable energy in particular in the development of EV vehicles, etc. We also face a number of challenges that touches on land use and big risk for land use for especially people living on the coast. I was on the front row of the major uh, disasters in East Wing Canada in the Atlantic when uh, Hurricane Fiona came zooming within 48 hours from the tropics to uh, the uh, Arctic and hit Nova Scotia in the process with uh, in, in Newfoundland, which uh, caused a tremendous uh, coastal erosion, landslide and coastal flooding. This is only one of uh, the 10 most damaging natural hazards and in terms of insurance payout uh, reaching into four billion dollar Canadian for Fort McMurray for the largest one to uh, Fiona which is at uh, 660 million uh, shortly after the event. This is only the private portion insured, insured uh, portion of the catastrophe where they will be claimed but the government has also to face uh, huge costs beyond these costs that uh, uh, cannot be covered through insurance. So the issue is very much front and center to uh, Canadian policymaker and Canadians in general and the urgency to act on climate change. Uh, this brings about uh, an opportunity and a need to act in terms of what we can do as geoscientists and in Canada coastal erosion is certainly a primary concern as well as permafrost melt in the north. Recently in Canada, another topic that has come about relative to uh, uh, land use is that Pan-Canadian Geoscience Strategy. We certainly uh, have been collaborating with other surveys and because of the nature of the Canadian Constitution, uh, the Geological Survey of Canada needs to work very closely with its uh, colleague in, uh, at the level of province and territories of Canada that have the primary role for resource management. We have developed a strategy that has been announced in early 2022 that uh, includes several pillars of geoscience, 
that uh, are laid out here, I encourage you to have a look at the uh, website that's listed here, where you will find a strategy that includes mission statements relative to the importance of geoscience for land use decisions. So I will give you now a number of examples of the type of work that we do that supports land use management in Canada. Um, the uh, offshore territory of Canada beyond the 200 uh, nautical uh, exclusive economic zone as uh, some territory that is in the extended continental shelf for which we have presented claims in 2013 and 2019. So that's a first application of geoscience because not only do we need to know the bathymetry of the ocean to make a claim and delineate uh, the extent of the territory, but we do have also to understand the ge geology uh, in order to uh, be able to make such claims. So uh, Josh survey has been working with colleagues at the uh, ocean department to uh, make this claim, which has been an extraordinary uh, exercise over the last decade. And uh, we're gonna be, uh, uh, possibly continuing to do work on this for years to come as the Commission on the, uh, of the United uh, Nations will uh, require an updated uh, submission in order to make its determination on the validity of the claim from Canada. We uh, also have uh, in the North a vast territory that up to uh, 2010 was remaining uh, largely on map and we made a very big push to develop geology map uh, at a scale that was uh, appropriate to support mineral exploration. Our approach in Canada is to uh, develop geoscience so that it is helpful for mineral exploration company. And without that understanding of what are the broad geology and what might be a possible prospect and greenstone belts and such, it's very hard to make any investment. So the geoscience we provide is a way to uh, incentivize, to reduce risk for uh, land development uh, through uh, investment from the private sector in Canada. So in just about 12 years, we covered all this vast 4 million square kilometer of territory on the onshore and offshore. We are still having to do more work on this and we're building on this work for the next uh, seven years. Uh, of uh, geomapping now called Gem Geo North. Here's an example of uh, detailed mapping uh, that was done on Baffin Island in Northern Canada that integrated uh, glacial uh, geology, uh, geophysical surveys, and bedrock geology. And from this, we were able to determine that there was a great potential for copper and nickel, which in turn attracted investors for uh, further exploration locally. We work with uh, indigenous communities to uh, uh, make them see the opportunity that, that might be for their communities to see some development from natural resourcing over that uh, territory. Geoscience is uh, also being used in the offshore for other purposes and uh, for extending our continental shelf. We have uh, some activities we call marine geoscience for marine sport spatial planning. Uh, the Department of Fisheries and Ocean in Canada is uh, doing an integrated approach to uh, understanding the uh, ecosystems and the various issues that lie on the seafloor and the ocean column. And we've been a key participant by using uh, seabed mapping to support uh, the, this evidence-based decision-making. We map the seafloor with the combination of uh, um, SWAT bathymetry, as well as uh, geological uh, mapping using some uh, grab sample from the seafloor. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, we can inform the uh, topic of uh, marine spatial planning. This has been a great opportunity to integrate with others. And uh, we see now a map of the offshore uh, geology of Nova Scotia and Eastern Canada. Where, which is uh, being used to uh, help uh, decide on infrastructures such as cable and informs the uh, decisions relative to uh, putting aside land for uh, marine conservation or other uh, specific use of, for economic development in the offshore. This is a growing field in Canada. 
We have uh, also issues that uh, relates to uh, climate change in the north, where we see uh, on the coast the effect of climate change and uh, permafrost melt causing extensive uh, uh, degradation of the coast and uh, fast uh, erosion. There's some rates of erosion in coastal retreat that reaches eight meters per year in northern Canada right now, something that is very worrisome for uh, northern communities. And we're trying to identify the uh, rate uh, that's happening so that there could be some measures taken, such as coastal retreat in advance, which can take quite a bit of time. We uh, use uh, also our mapping uh, in the offshore to understand the opportunities that might be vying for positioning wind turbines in the context of the shift to uh, green and renewable energy. Uh, here's our example, the type of infrastructure that could be laid in Eastern Canada. There's a few projects under development and the geotechnical nature of the seafloor is very crucial in terms of determining where we could do this, as well as other type of uh, use on the seafloor, such as sequestering carbon or uh, possible mineral development. We are also examining opportunities uh, to reduce uh, the risk from earthquake. There's been a, a gradual evolution from our assessment of earthquake uh, process to one where we are intimately working with others in the socioeconomic field to uh, develop a neighborhood scale national coverage of earthquake risk for all of Canada. This is a part of a, a system that uh, will be shortly online that will provide a visualization of the various uh, scenarios and risks that uh, will exist for cities such as Vancouver, Montreal, and Eastern Canada, and with Vancouver on the West Coast and other places in Canada that might face uh, important risk from uh, earthquake. We also produce predictive maps for uh, gauging, uh, evaluating the uh, amount of oil and gas that might reside in the offshore. This has served uh, enormously in engaging a dialogue with uh, policymakers and people in the communities uh, relative to economic opportunities versus uh, securing uh, areas for parks. Uh, the areas that are in red or those that are at lowest uh, petroleum potential, while the green ones have higher potential. So it leaves the decision makers uh, to uh, uh, engage and help uh, the community decide which are the area that we should set aside for parks. There might be some areas with high potential that might have greater value to be saved as an ecosystem protected area, but people make the decision knowing fully uh, what's there. We have finally a process that are tied with impact assessment. Here's a map of Ontario where we see in yellow in the upper part, left part of the screen, the uh, uh, ring of fire, a major uh, nickel deposit uh, that lies in Northern Ontario in the midst of indigenous community that have concern relative their groundwater and other uh, cumulative effects that might come from development. So we work uh, closely uh, with uh, uh, the developers understand their project and do an assessment more broadly over the territory of things like permafrost melting groundwater to help uh, the communities and deciding whether they want to support this type of development going forward as part of the formal uh, impact assessment process for um, Canada. So this is all for me. I thank you very much for your attention. I put a few links here. If you want to learn more about the Geological Survey of Canada, you can follow us on Twitter, find out about the Pan-Canadian Geoscience Strategy. And in closing, I'd like to say thank you very much to ASGMI for your continued support in developing the world community of geological surveys. Uh, there is uh, plenty of opportunity to uh, reach out to colleagues worldwide through this. We have a website as well as a Twitter line. And I'd like to also say that uh, I'm very happy to see that the uh, Secretariat and Chairmanship uh, is moving from the uh, Judicial Survey of Canada uh, over to uh, 
the Eurojust surveys where Julie Ollis, Secretary General to, of the Eurojust surveys, has accepted starting in January to take the lead. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I've been very privileged and honored to address you today on this topic. Bueno, excelente la presentación. Aunque ya le agradecimos su participación en esta asamblea mediante este vídeo, eh, reiteraremos el agradecimiento vía correo electrónico, porque realmente ha sido muy interesante. Eh, nos ha hecho una, primero una breve historia de la evolución del cerebro de la edad, con lo que hacía, de mediados del siglo XIX, y termina desde empezando con mapas geológicos, conocimientos geológicos, termina como un mensaje de geociencia para la sociedad. Y, y me permito destacar de esta presentación eh, un final, eh, su final, que no hemos tratado en ningún caso en esta asamblea, de, de actividad de servicio geológico en relación con el uso del territorio y la gestión, y es todo lo que están haciendo en geología marina. Desde la batimetría, la, la, la evaluación de recursos, la geología del subsuelo, qué tipo de sedimentos, y la, participando de las convenciones de Naciones Unidas sobre los derechos del mar, eh, que es un tema complejo a debatir. Y finalmente también introduciendo le, riesgos geológicos, eh, tanto en tierra de terremotos como lo que pueda ser de la dinámica costera, en erosión de costas por eh, calentamiento global, pérdida de hielos eh, marinos, etc. Luego que parece que es... Un punto que nos introduce, que nos permitirá eh, tenerlo también como referencia de que otros lo hacen ya, eh, porque en ASMI recientemente el último grupo de trabajo que se ha creado justamente es el de lo que llamamos grupos de expertos en geología marina. Algunos ya tienen experiencia, amplia experiencia, como es el IGME o como es el de Brasil, eh, pero otros están empezando. También en Colombia tienen un gran conocimiento, aunque ellos no, hacen, no hacían geología marina en sentido estricto, directamente ellos, pero sí colaboran con el Instituto, no sé cómo se llama formalmente, el Instituto Cartográfico o Geológico o Hidrográfico de la Marina, de la Armada eh, Colombiana, y participan en las investigaciones de los fondos marinos con, con una componente geológica. Lo que creo que es de agradecer la presentación que nos ha hecho eh, Daniel y se lo comunicaremos reconociendo su aportación, su valiosa aportación a esta, a esta asamblea. Continuamos con la presentación del tercer eh, invitado internacional, eh, David Coza, que es el secretario general de, de la OAX. OAX es la eh, Organización Africana de Servicios Geológicos. Y, y bueno, adelante con él. Thank you very much um, for the invitation uh, to participate in this um, extraordinary general assembly. Uh, my name is David Koza. I'm the um, OAGS um, Secretariat, which is the Organization of African Geological Surveys. Um, it is an organization that uh, represents um, geoscientific um, surveys across the African continent. So I also um, work for uh, my own country's geological survey, which is the Council for Geoscience. There, my role is the executive manager uh, of integrated geoscience development. Uh, we are responsible for, um, in effect, just implementing geoscientific projects uh, in, uh, in South Africa. So thanks. Um, I just want to give you a um, introduction to what the OAGS um, is, um, the organization that it represents, um, and also some of the projects that we've been doing uh, in the African continent. So um, the OAGS was um, established in 2007, um, around February, um, and it was really uh, meant to be the leading voice um, of geoscientific matters in the African continent. Uh, the idea was that uh, ge geological surveys come together, they promote uh, the contribution of geosciences in Africa's development, and assist um, lawmakers in particular uh, on the technical advice and what um, role uh, geosciences uh, can play uh, in Africa. It was also meant to promote and provide some sort of a collaborative network among African member states. The realization was that um, us uh, within the continent, we do not really uh, collaborate uh, with each other. So the OAGS was formed 
uh, to foster that, uh, that partnership. As far as the mandate uh, is concerned, um, it's really what I've spoken about, that um, the implementation of uh, geoscientific programs uh, across uh, Africa uh, in partnership uh, with uh, other uh, uh, global partners, other geoscientific uh, surveys uh, globally. And the idea was that we focus on uh, issues uh, relating to uh, economic development of Africa uh, in particular. So um, this is um, some of the uh, vision, mission, and values uh, of the OAGS, um, largely meant uh, to uh, develop African, uh, African geosciences in particular, um, and look at capacity building, information sharing, joint project uh, implementation. And the membership uh, of the survey of the OAGS is open to all um, African geological surveys, uh, which is currently about uh, 54 countries, but we only have about 40 active members. This is simply because some of the African countries uh, do not have uh, geological surveys uh, uh, existing currently. And we are working with those countries' ministries uh, to, to develop uh, geological surveys. As far as the governance structure is concerned, um, we have uh, OAGS president uh, currently led by uh, the director of the National Geological Survey of Senegal, uh, Dr. Rokaya, and she is supported by vice presidents uh, across the regions. So we've got the regions in um, Northern Africa, Central Africa, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, and Western Africa. And these are the vice presidents that are supporting uh, the president. And then um, our CEO of the Council for Geoscience is the permanent secretariat. Um, of the OAGS. So this the secretariat is basically responsible for coordinating efforts uh, within, within, the, with, within the OAGS and supporting uh, the, the, the executive committee uh, in implementing mandate of the OAGS. So as far as geological surveys are concerned uh, in Africa, um, they're really not that dissimilar um, to uh, many of the geological surveys in Europe, in North America, uh, in Asia, in that their role is to provide uh, geoscientific information. This information um, needs to be used um, for very specific purposes. So in our case, uh, as the OAGS, OAGS members collect uh, both onshore and offshore uh, geoscientific data, and this information is uh, used to um, encourage uh, in, in, in other regions, minerals and energy assessment, groundwater resources, looking at environmental issues, uh, agricultural development, infrastructure development, and uh, assisting in the mapping and the characterization of the different uh, geohazards. Um, so uh, this is largely what geological surveys in Africa uh, are responsible for. And being scientific organizations, they have to conduct uh, geoscience uh, research. So in terms of uh, the collaborations and partnerships, um, one of the key mandates of the OAGS is to develop uh, and form uh, collaborative partnerships with within the OAGS, but also with organizations outside uh, Africa. And over the last couple of years, the OAGS um, has been um, implementing a couple of projects, particularly with the European Geological Survey, so Eurogeo Surveys. Um, and this uh, project has largely been a training component um, that has different work packages, um, and that is meant to really provide training uh, to different uh, uh, African geological surveys. So the PANAP Geo project, um, it, it's largely been a, a training program, and the first phase of the program concluded around 2019, and we are now implementing the second phase uh, of the project uh, also supported by the, by the European Geological Surveys, and that is also uh, uh, largely in part a, a, a practical training group. So um, we also collaborate with other geological surveys within Africa. So the Geological Society of Africa um, is uh, one of our key partners. And currently we are putting, uh, we are efforting uh, to get the OAGS to be formally recognized within the African Union. And this is very, very important in a sense that um, if it's formally recognized in the AU structures, then it can really be official uh, uh, leading voice of matters related to geosciences within the African continent. 
so there's a there's a there's an effort to uh, jointly um, recognize OAGS within the structures of the African Union. So what does the OAGS focus on? Um, and I mentioned this uh, before that um, a big part of uh, the focus points for the OAGS is to look at um, issues around community safety, so geological hazards, understanding um, where seismicity is, subsidences, landslides, and all manner of geological hazards across the African continent. Uh, and this is this is quite critical, particularly when one starts to look at uh, what's happening now globally in terms of uh, climate change. And we know that we're going to have a lot of these uh, a lot of these geohazards uh, to deal with. So a big part of the research across the African continent uh, is looking at um, geological hazards. Water security is a big issue across the globe, but particularly in Africa. Uh, minerals resources development. Um, we know that in order for us to transition uh, to a low carbon economy, we need to find these uh, these minerals, and a lot of them would be in Africa. So OAGS is fostering implementation of projects with African member states uh, to characterize these uh, minerals in each uh, African country. Energy security, uh, environmental mapping, uh, marine economy, science-based policy design. This is quite important uh, because um, OEGS feels like a lot of the policies that have been developed in Africa, they are not informed necessarily by uh, robust uh, scientific inputs. Uh, and this is where uh, the OAGS would like to um, seriously strengthen uh, the capacity within African member states to be able to contribute uh, to scientific policy design. Research and innovation, I mentioned before, uh, and this is largely uh, so that uh, you know continuous research can be done within the African continent, looking specifically at these issues. So um, one of the one of the the, the, the critical programs uh, that we'll be embarking on in the next couple of years is regional um, characterization of groundwater resources across the African continent, and this is looking at characterizing in particular um, aquifers along uh, uh, political boundaries, uh, if you like. So this transboundary aquifer mapping program is meant to look at. Um, how countries within Africa can collaborate across the borders in mapping um, water basins that are uh, across uh, each borders. Um, it is becoming increasingly clear that water, water groundwater in particular, uh, will become um, a, a, a critical issue of contention uh, among the different member states. And this is why the OAGS is focusing on um, understanding groundwater resources uh, in particular, uh, along continent, along the, the, the country borders. Minerals resources, uh, it's exactly the same uh, in understanding and characterizing uh, different mineral potentials for all the, all the African countries. Um, though that information can be used to, to inform on how they can be sustainably exploited in, in, in uh, supporting net zero uh, objectives for each of the countries. And the focus in terms of minerals resources is really the critical minerals, so-called minerals of the future. Uh, these are minerals that are required and are necessary for uh, technologies needed uh, to transition to low carbon economy. In terms of community safety, um, this is really looking at uh, how we can characterize uh, subsidence, sinkholes, uh, landslides. Um, a lot of the African countries are suffering from landslides after heavy rain. And this need not be, and this is the understanding, the, the geotechnical understanding of where uh, these uh, landslides are likely to occur is quite critical, and that can inform uh, infrastructure development in places. So some of the key projects um, that the OAGS has done, um, the Geological and Mineral Map of Africa, um, at one in five million scale, that map has been uh, published uh, for the whole Africa. Uh, the seismotectonic map, um, also at the same scale, this looks at areas that are most active uh, when it comes to seismicity. Uh, Geoheritage is quite key uh, for the OAGS, and this is really in fostering local economic development in identifying some of these uh, geo sites uh, that can be used uh, you know, to foster tourism development, uh, for example. I mentioned Panat Geo Project. Uh, this program uh, has really been a training program um, that has provided provided training um, for over a thousand geoscientists across uh, different African uh, countries, and this is uh, continuing um, as we speak um, on a practical uh, component where geoscientists 
uh, are introduced to different work packages when it comes to minerals, groundwater, geotechnical, um, geological mapping, things like that. Uh, so that is currently ongoing, uh, phase two, and this is a collaboration with the European Geological Service. I mentioned the transboundary aquifer mapping program um, and also focusing on uh, infrastructure um, in terms of uh, having key um, scientific uh, equipment um, that um, African member states can have access to for them to use to collect uh, the necessary data. Uh, in uh, development and hosting of integrated geoscience data portal. This is really, really key. Um, the idea is that we have one portal, data portal across the African continent. So it's, it's a very ambitious uh, target, uh, but we've already started working on this. And this would be a, a portal that hosts all manner of geological information, geophysical data, geochemical data, hydrogeology, geotechnical information. And this is really meant to be a one-stop shop uh, for everybody, any, anyone wanting access to the data, whether locally or internationally. And this would be important in terms of developing uh, uh, research uh, programs. So the data portal um, uh, uh, program, if you like, um, is really meant to uh, get uh, African member states uh, to identify what the base geoscience data sets they have. Um, and uh, each country then must prioritize uh, the different themes, uh, as I mentioned. So whether it's minerals, water, uh, geotechnical, um, all of those thematic areas, uh, those data sets that have been identified can be used uh, for, that, uh, for that purpose. And um, we use then the geoscience uh, portal uh, to disseminate uh, that information. And the idea is that this, is, this would be freely available information uh, across uh, uh, African, uh, African countries. And uh, given that all of, the, all of the geological surveys are meant to do research, um, it's, 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 it's most important that we focus on modern uh, geoscience data and interpretation techniques uh, that can be uh, develop, developed. One of the most important um, uh, items for the OAGS is how to communicate this information uh, to, to the different uh, communities. Um, there's no point in collecting this information and we don't really get to inform uh, policy development and that, that uh, this information is meant to assist and these are the local uh, uh, communities. So a big part of uh, the, the, the program that we are doing is how to effectively communicate this geoscience, uh, this geoscience data. Ultimately, though, we'd like this knowledge uh, to contribute to policy formulation in line with the continental policy uh, on Agenda 2063. So this is really the, the, ultimate, uh, the ultimate intention when it comes to OAGS. All the projects that we're doing um, are following uh, this uh, project implementation framework uh, where we assess whether that project has uh, had the necessary uh, impact. So the data portal, as I mentioned, is quite, uh, is quite important and we'll be publishing the first version of it uh, towards the, the beginning of, uh, of next year. And really this is looking at having the ability to host all manner of uh, data sets so that that information can be uh, disseminated to different member states and also to other uh, 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 people who are interested outside the African continent. Infrastructure development in supporting African member states. This is uh, information regarding uh, um, you know, having the ability to have a, a high performance computing, uh, various an analytical equipment, uh, XRD, XRF, um, and having the ability to collect uh, information ourselves across the African continent. Uh, so we're hoping that we'll get, we'll, we'll get enough momentum so that we should be able uh, to run these type of um, data collection and also uh, analysis uh, uh, ourselves. Capacity building across the African continent. This is part of what PANAF Geo is trying to do. Um, and this is really developing more and more geological, uh, geoscientific skills. And here, you know, it's, it's really about having access to modern equipment and modern softwares for geoscientists to be able to use. Um, and this is uh, where uh, the, the key driver uh, has been. And we, we are currently uh, looking at uh, joint um, uh, implementation and having a pool of instruments that can be shared uh, 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 across the African continent. And the, the, the capacity that needs to be built is not only related to you know, knowing how to look at geoscientific information, how to collect it, uh, but also how to communicate 
uh, that information, particularly to the uh, to the communities that uh, that we represent. So, um, a, a, a large part of the, the, the sustainability of African geosciences, in particular, depends on having financial resources, uh, but also having forming collaborative projects. Um, or implementing collaborative programs with international organizations. So I'm hoping that um, this uh, uh, discussion that uh, you will be having here will stimulate uh, yourselves as an organization, as a group, uh, to, to collaborate with the OAGS in implementing some of the programs uh, in Europe and also uh, in Africa. Thank you very much uh, for the attention, and um, I hope to meet all of you uh, soon. Thank you very much. Bueno, le agradecemos a, a David su presentación y, bueno, eh, son como nosotros, con menos historia, eh, seguramente por lo que ha puesto ahí con debilidades con, de algunos servicios geológicos. Y a mí me, me ha pedido una cosa interesante y es en los proyectos que estén en, en marcha, algunos en ASM ya los hemos cubierto, el mapa eh, de recursos minerales de África ya está hecho metalogénico de América del Sur y de América del Caribe, de lo que están haciendo de acuíferos transfronterizos se está abordando en este momento, el cielo de Gaster también. Eh, en fin, hay cosas que, que has mirado un poquito por adelante. Pero hay una cosa que me ha parecido interesante eh, y habría que explorar la posibilidad de implementación acá, es lo de eh, compartir equipamiento y eh, recursos. Y había una fotografía de unos camiones para sísmica de reflexión. Eh, y esto me ha recordado que los colegas de, de Honduras eh, pues necesitan, necesitan dotarse de, de instrumentación para el laboratorio, aunque sea muy elemental. Y anoche, hablando, comentaban la posibilidad de que algún servicio geológico de los más potentes de ASMI, que para ellos tengan equipamiento al laboratorio que se ha quedado obsoleto porque lo han renovado y lo tienen sin utilizar, que se le podría hacer una cesión. Y yo lo comentaba, quizá, eh, por ejemplo, material que se ha podido quedar medio obsoleto porque ha evolucionado la tecnología, eh, para lo más elemental en la geología, que es el hacer láminas delgadas para estudios petrográficos de minerales, que es la primera caracterización, pues yo creo que igual en laboratorio, en instituciones como, eh, digo el ISME porque es en el que trabajé tiempo, pero también en Colombia, en Argentina, probablemente tengan, o el propio Brasil, tengan equipamientos de microscopios petrográficos que ya no usan o que han modernizado, eh, herramientas, útil, vamos, utensilios para hacer láminas delgadas, que también la tecnología ha evolucionado de pasar a ser estrictamente manual, a ser semiautomático, y a lo mejor se puede buscar esa vía. Y me he acordado de ver que ellos plantean como alternativa dentro de la OAX eh, ese compartir eh, instrumentación y equipamiento. Y, por supuesto, todo lo que pretenden de crecimiento, cooperación, etc. Eh, yo propondré mañana a la Asamblea, eh, si facilitamos un acercamiento con la OAS, con la Unión de Servicios Geológicos Africanos, para firmar un acuerdo de mejor entendimiento, como tenemos con ONGS, y estrechar las relaciones en la medida que esta es la primera vez que participan en un evento nuestro. Y por la misma podríamos intercambiar experiencias y aprender unos de otros. Así que mañana lo propondré formalmente en la, en la Asamblea de Asuntos Administrativos y de Gestión de la ASMI. Y bueno, pasamos a la, a la siguiente presentación, que va a estar a cargo del doctor Bill Cunningham, como dije al principio, y el doctor Gustavo Bisbal. Ambos son los responsables del Servicio de los Estados Unidos de Relaciones Internacionales. Eh, Bill, para el mundo, digamos, de, del USGS hacia el exterior. Y, y Gustavo más focalizado en, en el hemisferio occidental, básicamente en, en América Latina. Eh, con él eh, estamos manteniendo una relación eh, fluida de intercambio de experiencias. Él eh, ha ocupado el puesto que antes desempeñaba eh, Víctor Hayway, que muchos de acá lo conocéis, eh, desde 2016 que acordamos en la Asamblea de Bogotá, de ASMI, eh, firmar un acuerdo de entendimiento entre ambas organizaciones, el USGS y ASMI, que se firmó en febrero de, de 2017 en Quito. La colaboración ha sido intensa, franca, eh, cordial y de hecho se ha plasmado en la participación de, de sus expertos en metalogenia en el mapa metalogenético de América del Caribe 
eh, en contrapartida, han permitido que el Grupo Metalogenia de, de ASMI haya, esté participando, haya participado en un proyecto de evaluación del potencial de recursos minerales en las Antillas Mayores. Y también eh, tuvimos la fortuna de recibir un taller de capacitación en, en paralelo con la Asamblea de, de ASMI en 2019 en, en Tegucigalpa, un curso corto impartido por ellos justamente con la metodología de evaluación de potencial de recursos minerales, metálicos y no metálicos, a partir del conocimiento geológico básico, sin necesidad de que haya un estudio geoquímico previo ni de eh, anomalías de ningún tipo, ni de geofísica ni geoquímicas. Un método fundamentado en tres eh, elementos eh, que fue un éxito. Eh, como decía antes, aquí vemos en la pantalla a Gustavo. Gustavo, bienvenido, muchas gracias por participar, muchas gracias por el madrugón que te das sabiendo que la diferencia horaria son ocho o nueve horas. Eh, ya sé por otras conversaciones que hemos tenido a través de la pantalla y por correo que te desayunas bien temprano con un mate, recordando tus orígenes eh, argentinos, ahí lo tienes. <ríe> y, y bueno, como decía al principio, eh, la presentación, según me dijiste, la va a hacer personalmente Bill. Eh, las diapositivas eh, van a estar en español, el eh, hablar en inglés, eh, pero en cualquier caso yo, como ya hicimos en abril, eh, preferiría que seas tú, eh, ya que contigo tenemos una relación eh, fluida desde hace meses, que seas tú quien como miembro, amigo, colaborador de ASMI, seas tú quien presente a Bill y que él nos haga la presentación y si hubiera preguntas o tal, y si sabemos español, que seas tú quien le traduzca y seas nuestro como ya eres, el enlace de los Estados Unidos con, con ASMI. Así que, Gustavo, eh, bienvenido, bienvenido, Bill, y aquí estamos para escucharos. <risa> 